Hello, and welcome to my talk about using DNA to solve unknown parentage cases. I'm a blogger. My name is Kitty Cooper. I blog about DNA and genetics, and I'm looking forward to sharing my insights on unknown parentage searches with you today. First, some housekeeping. Here's my the URL for my blog, and here is the URL for these slides. My slides are always online at slides.com and available publicly available, so you can always go look for any of my recent presentations there. And at the bottom, that's what my blog looks like, so if you see that, when you, you've gone to the right place. So a question I get is, why does testing your DNA help figure out unknown parentage? I mean, what if, if my parent hasn't tested? Well, the answer is because you get half of your DNA from each parent and they get half of their DNA from each of their parents, your DNA is the sum of all those ancestors, more from the more recent ones, and it can be figured out from your cousin matches because they will share a fair amount of you that same DNA. So you have to test your DNA. Now, the two sites that don't take transfers are Ancestry and 23andMe, and I recommend you test them both places. If you have any biological close relatives, getting them tested will also help. It'll help you sort through the side that you know as opposed to the side that you don't know. So what next? Upload the Ancestry DNA results, those the raw data to several other sites for free to get more matches. You can upload to MyHeritage, you upload to Family Tree DNA. Now at those sites, you don't get the extra tools unless you pay some extra, but you can at least see if you have enough matches for it to be worthwhile to pay for the extra tools. GenMatch is completely free, although again, you there are extra cool tools if you pay a, mere, a small fee. Finally, Living DNA, which is primarily British, so you won't have a lot of matches if you're not British, but it's certainly a very interesting site. So how do you figure this out from cousin matches? Well, have a look at this screen. This is uh, from the ISOG wiki, which is my go-to site for most everything DNA. And you can see that like, you'll share 12.5% of your DNA with a first cousin. That's a lot. A second cousin, you'll share a little over 3%. That's still enough to figure things out. So you need to understand how all these cousin things work. So here's my trick. I like the G trick. How many Gs tells you what the cousin level is. So if you share a grandparent, your first cousins. If you share a great grandparent, they're two Gs, two Gs. Second cousin, a great great grandparent, three Gs. Third cousin, now what if your great-grandparents are his great-great-grandparents. Well, you're in different generations. So you go with the shortest route. You have the two Gs, so you're the second cousin. And he is a different generation, so that makes it once removed. If, he was, if they were his great-great-great-grandparents, he'd be twice removed. Now, if you are primarily American, and your roots are deeply American, you may not need to test anywhere besides ancestry. I've had Kate, seen people who had this come up right away. The unknown parent had already tested. They were looking for them. Or a half sibling, maybe an aunt, maybe an uncle. Remember that number, 1878, because we're going to do some fun things with it. This close family could be aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, or half sibling or a grandparent. You cannot tell them apart from the total centimorgans. You see that little C and the big M? That stands for centimorgans, and that's how we measure DNA. A first cousin, that's likely a first cousin at 896 centimorgans. Again, you may be able to figure out right away from good matches like these. So 
go carefully. I uh, always recommend you save all the information immediately, any trees they have there, because they may freak out when they see the match with you and, and remove their DNA. There's a lot of good advice at DNA adoption. I have the URL up here for what to do when you're ready to make contact with that closer relative. Let's presume, however, you didn't get that lucky and you have to use more and more distant relationships. So one thing I want you to understand how to use is this online calculator. It's really terrific. So the URL for this is it's at dnapainter.com and you go to tools and look for the shared Centimorgan calculator. Now let's put in our 1878. What do you see? Grandparent, aunt, uncle, half sibling, niece, nephew, grandchild. Well, let's assume not a grandchild because we know who our grandchildren are. So it now lights up all the possible relationships. Note that sibling lit up below, even though it wasn't in the relationship probability that did the DNA K geek had calculated. So that sort of puzzled me. So I, if you click on any of these boxes, you'll get this wonderful little chart that shows you a histogram that shows you how many people were in the ranges. And you can see that the 1868 really isn't gonna be a full sibling. It's just too far off the scale. Most full siblings are falling between 2,300 and 3,000. In fact, I know my own brother is at 27 something. So the basic methodology to resolve an unknown parentage issue, it means you must analyze and build the trees of your best matches. You look at how they match each other and you try to figure out the, the common ancestors. That's called pedigree triangulation. So you are looking for common ancestors between the DNA relatives that are unknown to you, looking at those second, third, and fourth cousins. Once you have common ancestors, you build the tree from those common ancestors back down. Now, I usually have a research tree, and there's going to be more than one pair of common ancestors, hopefully, and you build the tree down until you get to grandparents or great-grandparents. As far as you can go, once you get to the living, it's much harder. This is what we're hoping for. If you, let's say we are looking for an unknown father. We're hoping for a common ancestral couple on each side, one of whom had a son and one of whom had a daughter who happened to marry each other. That will be the parents of the unknown father, the grandparents of you if you're the adoptee. So once you have that, you take, put a person who's the child of those unknown parents and build their tree back to at least 1800. This is my tree, so it's kind of fun to show it off. But I find that if you build the pedigree back to at least 1800, you'll be able to do something with it. Uh, you want the tree to start out as private and unsearchable, but once you're ready to use it, you have to make it searchable so through lines will do the work for you. To get those ancestry through lines working, you add a fake child to the, the parent you are suspecting, a child of that couple, and you connect your DNA to the fake child. And I often call the child fake test so nobody can be confused by it in case they do get a match to me and wonder about it. So I go to settings on my DNA page. I scroll down until I see test settings. Then I find the family tree linking box and I'm gonna click that edit button. All right, and then I'm going to select a pedigree tree that I have made, and I'm going to link my DNA results to the fake test person in the tree. And Ancestry will often autocomplete the name for you. It's pretty easy to do this. Isn't genealogy all about waiting? Well, it often takes a day or two to get the hints to come in for your DNA, but um, Sometimes it's overnight, sometimes it takes days. It just depends on what they're doing over at Ancestry. Then you go to your DNA match page and you click on the filter common ancestors and that will bring up just the common ancestors and now you wanna see, do they fit my theory? So if you click on a person's name, it'll go to 
the page and on the page it'll show you the common ancestors with the person the hint has found and does that fit your theory you look at the shared matches look at the centimorgans and make up your mind i love when you click on the ancestor it shows you the pathway um, this is my distant cousin elsie who i've never even contacted and then uh, but we, I discovered that she's my fourth cousin once removed. I seem to have more DNA from that side of the family. And um, there she is, beautifully laid out. Yes, those are Norwegian names. So you're ready to solve a case? Okay, I'm going to walk you through a case I solved. Tessa was looking for her father. All she knew was his surname was Padilla and that it was an encounter at a town in California and she knew what year, and that's all she knew. Nothing else forthcoming. At least her mother had tested. Now, it's really helpful if you're looking for an unknown father, if your mother tests or a half sibling, because you can separate out who's paternal and who's maternal. And in this case, you can also look at ethnicity. Sometimes ethnicity is a huge clue. Look at all the ethnicities Tessa has that her mom does not. Spain, Portugal, Indigenous Americas, Mexico, Ireland, Indigenous America, and so So what would you think if you saw these ethnicities? Think about it for a minute. Would you think Mexico? Pretty close. Because of the Portugal, the amount of Portugal in Spain, I think more like deep Southwestern Hispanic heritage. In fact, to me, that says New Mexico. And when I looked at the surnames of some for matches on the father's side, Martinez, um, Cordova, uh, just the, the surnames spoke to me and said, New Mexico. Now that may be because I had lived in Albuquerque for seven years. So I learned a lot about the early Spanish settlers of the area and that they often married Native American wives and of course now they those pure hispanic lineages don't like to admit it um but the problem is they're endogamous now if you don't know what endogamous is it means that somebody who's your fifth grandfather might be your fifth grandfather five times because third cousins were marrying second cousins were marrying there's just a lot of collapse in the pedigree because there weren't enough people to go around when you have endogamy like that you really cannot solve one of these unknown cases without second cousin matches. That's what you need, second cousin level matches. Okay, so I told Tessa maybe not, but she had three of those. And I went over the 23andMe and she'd been contacted by this person who actually figured out from who Tessa matched that Tessa was from the second wife of his grandfather. So, uh, and that they were, first cousins once removed, half first cousin once removed, which notice, notice these ranges down here. The ranges of the first cousin once removed is practically the same as the second cousin. So this seemed like a pretty good theory. It's really nice when someone is that helpful. So we're assuming then that a son of Jose Padilla and that second wife, Apollonia Montoyo, and another fine New Mexican name, Looking at her two other second cousin matches, one on my heritage and one on ancestry, we see a common ancestor named Martinez. Now, neither of those matches responded, and neither of them had much of a tree, but I built their trees. That's what you do when you do this work. You build the tree for them. And sure enough, I found common ancestors between the my heritage and ancestry matches. One of them called Eugenio and Maria Martinez. And in one case, these people were the grandparents, the great grandparents, so it was a true second cousin. And the other case, they were the grandparents, but again, it was a case with multiple marriages, so it was another half cousin once removed. All right, so we need to find now one of these Martinez's married to a Padilla, descended from the Padilla side, right? How do we do that? That's not that easy because a lot of these people might still be living, but we got lucky. There was this incredibly beautiful obituary in the Albuquerque 
uh, paper, the Albuquerque Times saying, Albuquerque Journal, excuse me, for um, Trinidad Martinez, who was the presumed great grandfather of Artessa. And we went through that and sure enough, there's a Mrs. Louise Padilla, yay. So that sounds really promising. That might be the Martinez Padilla pairing that we're looking for. So did Pascual Padilla have a son named Luis? Yes, Luis Padilla, and I was dancing on my chair at this point, married Teresa Martinez, who was descended from Eugenio and Maria, and Luis is descended from Jose Pascual Padilla. Now those Jose's, we forget them because all the Roman Catholic people at that time, the men were called Jose, and then their real name, their middle name was the name they were called by. Now you see a problem with this? You see that nine sons on the left? Yeah, they had nine sons. So we have nine candidates for Tessa, Tessa's father. So what's the next question? Oh yeah, just to show you how three different sites, three different matches, but yet we found a pedigree triangulation. So which of those nine sons was in California at the right time? Only two of them, that's wonderful. So now Tess is just amazing. She called the librarian of the small town that the Padillas were from and got copies of the obituaries and lots of information. And it turned out neither possible father was still alive. But she tracked down a son of each one and talked them into testing. And as she was doing that, another match came in at 23 Me, Julie, and she shared 774. She was the daughter of one of those men. So that means she's either Tessa's half niece or her first cousin once removed. Now, because one brother is Tessa's half sibling and the other brother is her first cousin. So the, this, this either this box or this box. And you know, the ranges overlap. We can't really tell. I mean, yes, half niece looks better, but it's not for sure. We need more tests, but sure enough, the brothers came in. What do you think? Well, I mean, either one could be the half brother, but the, the 11 is really unlikely and the 1425 is, and guess what? The 1425 is the father of Julie. So these are her half brother and her first cousin. And Tessa has been totally welcomed into her father's family. Here she is with her half brother and her half niece. And it's wonderful when you get a happy ending like this. It doesn't always happen this way. Although a lot of unknown fathers, if they didn't know about the child, they or their family are often quite welcoming. It really, it just depends. So if you wanna learn more about how to do an unknown parentage search, there are classes at DNA Adoption. They're very good classes. There are a lot of helpful people on Facebook in the DNA Detectives group, and they have a lot of files in their file section. And guess what? I have a lot of stuff on my blog. And uh, if you go to Help for Adoptees, you can read some other success stories, including Tessa, and a lot of the uh, posts I've written about how to do this work. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'll see you in the chat rooms or leave me a question on my blog. Happy to help.